So big audience, I have four quick questions for you. Uh, the first is, how many of you use a module loader? And please be honest, this is for science. All right, we're filming it, so I'm going to count every one of you at some point and post the numbers. Next question, how many of you document every module that you write? There's at least some form of generated documentation you're producing, maybe using doc.js or something like that, JS doc. All right, a little bit fewer. Don't be embarrassed. I've been there, too. Um, how many of you test, have at least one test for every single module in your application? All right, pretty, pretty good. And then the final question, how many of you code review everything, every commit, every pull request? Awesome. That's really good. Um, so thank you for participating. I'm a JavaScript developer. And I want to have successful JavaScript projects. So I created a JavaScript checklist that you just took a tiny piece of. And this talk is going to be about why you might want to use checklists, how to create a checklist for your uh, software development, and what I learned by creating and using a checklist. It's my hope that you'll leave this talk having, uh, at minimum, maybe rethinking what's really important for uh, JavaScript development, and maybe wanting to use checklists in your project. <clears throat> so why checklists? Uh, three reasons. The talk about each one. The first one is that over the last seven years, I've worked on or overseen at least 30 different JavaScript projects for about 20 companies. Big companies, small companies, big projects, small projects. IE6, Node WebKit, um, I've pretty much developed it all, different tools, different technologies, frameworks. But more importantly, I've seen a lot of different results. I've been on projects that have gone just amazingly well. I'm like high five in everybody, apps beautiful. Um, it's, just, it's just super successful. Yeah. Pandering, yeah. <laughs> um, but I've been on the opposite kind of project where everybody's finger pointing at each other, uh, the app never gets released. I've, had, uh, I've seen developers outsourcing their work so they can play video games every day. I've been through every horror story you can imagine. <laughs> and I want to avoid failure. Maybe I'm a glass half empty kind of type of person. Um, so I'm looking for anything that can help me and my team do it better. Uh, and checklists have a long history of transforming industries and making things better. I'm going to give two what I think are really powerful examples, uh, one in aviation, the other in healthcare. So hopefully, uh, well, hopefully some of you are familiar with the famous B-17, uh, the Flying Fortress, uh, World War II plane. Uh, while it was being developed, it was in a competition with another plane. Um, and it was expected to easily win because the B-17 flew faster than the plane, could go further, uh, could carry more bombs. It was superior in every way, but on the final day of final flight test day, the, tragically, the plane crashed, killing the pilot. And it was later determined it was due to pilot error. Boeing was in big trouble. They were like facing bankruptcy at this point. And the pilot who died was the chief uh, of flight testing for the whole US Army. So that was, <laughs> the, the plane was deemed too unsafe to fly. Slightly ironically, because the B-17 is known for taking so much damage and just keep flying. So they lost the contract, and, but fortunately, the Army still purchased a few planes. And so Boeing had a big challenge on its hand. How do we make this plane flyable? They came up with what seems so obvious now, the flight checklist. Um, it was the first use of a flight checklist, and Boeing test engineers then flew that plane, those test planes, for 1.8 million miles without any further incident, proving that, I think two things. One, that the Boeing uh, 17 could be flown, and that checklists were awesome. And it was put into production for World War II. So, Flight manifest or flight checklists have been around forever. Right now, there's a transformation of checklists in healthcare. Um, Dr. Atul Gawande, or Atul, sorry for the pronunciation problem, um, he heard a story about a young girl 
who fell in a frozen pond, whose heart stopped and was lifeless for over an hour and a half. And about, the story is about the amazing surgery team that did all these complex surgeries to save her. When he asked the surgery team, how did you do it? Uh, they said checklists. So he uh, put together a study that concluded in 2009 that showed by simply using a checklist, you can reduce mortality in surgery by 50%. So if any of you go into surgery, the one thing on your checklist should be, is the doctor using a checklist? So with that in mind, I started looking at existing checklists. And they're all, if you search online, there's a lot of good existing web developer checklists. This is one example. Um, but to me, they didn't really talk about what influences success. And that's what I really care the most about. Um, so while developing my checklist, I also um, was kind of, someone pointed out to me that these, the, my checklist is kind of similar to a, um, a development methodology, but I like checklists more than development methodologies because there's no philosophy, there's no values, there's no holy wars on extreme programming versus scrum. It's just, did you do it or did you not? So creating a checklist is very hard. Uh, you have to make sure that you have to identify the questions and tasks that actually matter. And you have to make it like something that someone actually wants to fill out. It can't just be, I've seen checklists hundreds and hundreds of items long for some Microsoft test checklist. Um, so to create our checklist, we reviewed all of our projects from top to bottom, trying to figure out the big things that went wrong or went right. Things like it, people were smart. But people are smart isn't a good specific task that you can put on checklists, so we had to break it down into things like the client or the, the customer does yearly trainings for their employees. Once we got all our specific tasks, we then measured them all and figured out how they impact, uh, how they influence success or, or failure of projects. And as we continue on uh, with our checklist, we'll improve it, adding items or removing it. So to measure influence, we use this equation here, and you can think of it as, um, th the best way to think about it is think of what an ideal task or question would be. An ideal task would always be checked when you've been successful, when you've been on project success, and never be checked, be unchecked, on every single failure. So it would have a influence factor of one. So again, we, we rated all of our projects to see what the, uh, or sorry, all of our questions to see what the influence factor was. So we came up with interesting results, or what some might say is just, of course, results. The most influential thing that we found was, can you release something within six months? I think most people would be like, yes, small projects are always much more likely to be successful. We also found some interesting things. Do you use a module loader was negatively influential, apparently. But this was, this was interesting only, I think, because this is a case of uh, correlation and not causation. So module loaders, we almost always use a module loader, and I suggest you do too. Um, module loaders, when we didn't use one, it was almost always the very smallest of project. And because the smallest of projects were so highly, like we think, cause success, small projects are correlated for us with not using a module loader, and that's why a module loader is slightly negatively influential. So, I'm gonna post all the data for this online for our 30 projects. It's not that many projects, but I think it's a good, good start. Um, and then post the data so people can look at it if they find it interesting. So let's, I'm gonna keep going through all of the other high development um, factors, influence, development factors that influence success. Do you code review everything? Very high, make sure you're code reviewing everything. It shares information around a company, and I think this is like almost as, as high as any other development factor. And I think people program better when they know someone's gonna be looking at their code. Uh, those are Batman eyes, in case you can't tell. Um, documentation and tests, very important also, um, for obvious reasons. Interesting thing that I like to interject in almost all my talks is the way that we encourage documentation and tests um, besides checklists, is a lot of people organize their projects like this where you have you know, a JavaScript folder and has every single JavaScript file in it, and then a test file with every, or test folder with every single test in it. 
we like to combine them so every module has its own folder and all of its resources. Um, and then we tend to add a demo page and a, uh, a test page that runs just this module's test. Excuse me. So a few other things that were interesting, but for development factors, um, continuous integration, dev, and being able to easily set up and deploy to a dev test staging production environment. Interesting thing about our data too, source control and issue trackers were not influential at all, only because we always use them on every single project. So I'm not gonna do the experiment where I don't use a source, con a source controller issue tracker, so I think I'm gonna keep it on the checklist. Okay, so hopefully right now, a lot of you are feeling pretty good about you know, what you do, right? And you're, you're, you've done a lot of these development checklists, and you're feeling pretty good about your project's chances of success. Well, maybe you shouldn't. Oh, I missed, what can I hit that faster? Okay. <laughs> um, because all your power and all your skills can mean nothing against the bad choices of design teams and managers. So, so in our review, we found the most impactful things were the things that we were asking of design teams and managers. Because you might write perfect, fast, 100% test coverage, everything great, but you might be write, making an ugly app that no one's ever gonna see. We've had, I've had a project where the management team couldn't decide between uh, making the app work for, um, this was before responsive design, making the app work for a mobile um, or making it work for desktop. So we ended up building an application that was designed for mobile, but only desktop IE8 users were using. <laughs> and, but this, don't get me wrong, this doesn't make me happy as a developer. I wanna come and swoop in, teach everybody how to do JavaScript the right way, and single-handedly save the project. Um, so the real message what I like to get across, besides checklists are great, is to say this to all the developers here. If you really care about project success, you gotta care about more than just technology choices. You have to make sure design and management are doing the right things for you and the right things for the project. This can be really tricky to do. Right? It's very easy to like step on a manager's toes and then get defensive. Um, and you don't want to be confrontational. That, that's not successful. But checklists, we've found, are very useful for like, you know, talking with them, to walk them, to walk design and management teams through <laughs> um, to a checklist. Because it's like, it's, it's just, oh, it's a checklist. We're either doing it or not. You should take a look at it. So I'd like to also walk you through what management and design factors were most important for us. So great design um, was obviously, uh, oh, so for great design, user testing was the most important thing. M makes sense to me. Uh, gotta make sure that your designers are getting in front of users as quickly and as often as possible. Um, also because designers sit at kind of the junction between users, managers, and developers, if they're producing good wireframes, mockups, design documentation, um, that's very impactful. So for great management, um, what may, what, in our experience, great management makes sure people know what they're trying to do, that they are able to do it, and that they're having fun doing it. So our numbers came out to be that, um, we ask that you know, every team, uh, the management gives us a vision, goals, strategy, roadmap, explaining what we're trying to accomplish. That was really important. Uh, yearly trainings, making sure you're investing in your people, getting them the skills to do what they're doing is also highly influential. Released in six months, we already talked about. And then finally, uh, social events were surprisingly effective. And, Thinking about our history more, that makes sense. I've been on projects where people have physically fought, and have also been on projects where people make awesome, awesome Harlem Shake videos. Yeah, hopefully you have this kind of environment at work, because it's awesome. So, I flew through my slides. I was like 18 minutes every time, and now I'm 14.30. Sorry for talking so fast, apparently. Um, the, I posted the checklist here, 
Um, and I'm going to put all the data up shortly. I didn't have time to sanitize it yet because I don't want you know, uh, people knowing who, who we're working for and stuff like that. Um, and this is just my checklist, though. Right? You, you have a whole different sort of experiences. And if you see me walking around after this conference, please come up and talk to me. I'd love to hear what you think it makes a project successful or any horror stories you have. Um, and the important thing is also just, I've, in my maturity as a developer, have really started to look at management and design issues. Um, and I think we get caught up in arguing about technology a lot. But on your projects, if you really care about success, you know, Think about what management and design is doing. Um, so, yeah, thank you. <laughs>